And you are live. I can see it. We're live. What's happening, everyone? Interwebs, how are you doing? We'll give you guys a few minutes to trickle in here on the various platforms. Tell us where you're from. Say hello. As always, we want to know what's going on. Oh, wife making a guest appearance in the background. What up, Amanda? Probably shut Come that on, door. Amanda. Yeah, say she's hi. like, I'm out of here. <laughs> Internet makes me nervous. All right, guys. Tell us where you're coming from. Say what's up. There we go. Starting to flow in slowly here. We have a special guest today. If you look just below my feet, there's a head hovering. Yeah, we can pull it up just a little bit. Say, hi. Hi, I'm Ava. <laughs> That's my dog, Ava, for those of you keeping score at home. All right, let's go ahead and, and dive right into this, guys. Welcome to uh, our Plus Q&A. If this is your first Plus Q&A, maybe you just joined the platform or, or just jumped inside of Plus. The way this works uh, you probably noticed inside your Plus dashboard, there's a ton of different events. There's Q&As, there's a video analysis section where Nate and I analyze your strokes. There's live trainings. We actually did one last night on single strategy, but we get in here and interact with you guys fairly regularly. So make sure you check out your Plus dashboard and see all the different things we've got coming up. Also, don't forget you have a, I guess, you've got all these live recordings in your dash. So like, for example, if you're in, in Plus and you missed the single strategy and tactics training from last night, it's going to pop up in your dash within the next week. So anything that you wish you could see, but maybe, you know, work gets in the way or I never let work, work. in the way of my tennis, but yeah. you know, if you can't or make one of these players. calls, don't worry about it. Work. All these videos are recorded inside of your <laughs> plus dashboard. Um, lastly, don't forget you can submit some questions ahead of the call to make sure your questions get answered. Sometimes these live streams get really busy oh, with sorry. lots of people. So um, follow the instructions in your plus dashboard and submit any questions you have ahead of time. And with that, we're actually going to start today. We've got two questions that were submitted ahead of time for this call. From our plus members, right? From our plus members. What do we one, have? Who's up? One from Dean. Dean is a 4-0 in Florida. What's up, Dean? And Dean would like to know, hopefully, Dean, if you're on here, if not, you know, hopefully you'll watch the uh, the recording in your dashboard. But Dean wants to know, does it matter if you're using a new racket or strings or should both be new? You want to field this question? Um, yeah, does it matter? So I think maybe what he's asking is when trying a new racket, should you also be trying new strings? Um, so th the biggest innovation in the game in the last decade has been the strings, right? Sure. So, um, and you got to be careful because I know on our forum, on the Talk Tennis forum, the Player Courts uh, Facebook page, we have a ton of dialogue about, you know, new rackets and new strings and they're getting them from, um, you know, whether it be Tennis Express or wherever they're getting the demos. And so a lot of times what's happening is, is they typically string with like a sin gut, which is a pretty neutral string, um, but those rackets will lose tension. So you want to start with a frame and you want to start with, with whatever string you're used to, because that's going to immediately give you the feedback on the frame itself. And then you want to maybe examine what strings uh, you want to use because like a polyester or a multifilm, they're going to play very, very different, right? Like the polyester is without a doubt the biggest innovation because you're talking about a string that snaps back that really helps produce uh, spin, the, the RPMs. So I would always advise trying the two separately if they're new. So like if I'm playing with an old racket, I would maybe try – a different string and then if i wanted to try a new racket i would use the string i'm accustomed to and then really adopt. Yeah, i'm and, learning myself here today That's yeah, smart. and then adopt the uh <clears throat> the new strings and try them as a combo but they're, they're all going to feel very very different very cool i didn't know the answer to that question so i'm glad nate works here because so i'm here he's much smarter than i am at this tennis is. <laughs> i was going to see if you're going to qualify that i was like there's no way that's when a it comes standing, to technology uh, I think I got him. Yeah, All right, well. this next one's kind of a long one. This is Eric from Arlington, Virginia. Eric, what's going on, my dude? Um, what's up, Eric? This is a little long-winded, but I want to read it all so that everybody knows exactly you know, what we're thinking about in, in producing this answer. Um, Eric says, most times I feel like there's a huge disparity between when I am practicing with someone versus playing Hold a on, match. No, no, no. you got to start with the way it reads. <laughs> all right. <laughs> 
Just the first paragraph. All right, all right. So Eric says, hi, Scott and Nate. I would like for you both to work with me around the clock, analyze my game, and methodically plan out my lesson progression for the foreseeable future so I can have Federer's forehand and Dahl's mental game while Rinka's backhand, Djokovic's defense and court sense, and become a 7-0 player. You know what? On second thought, you guys are probably too busy, so let me ask you this question instead. (laughs) Uh, That's pretty good time, Eric. That gave us a good chuckle for sure. Um, So Eric's question. Most times I feel like there is a huge disparity between when I am practicing with someone versus playing a match, as in something is breaking down. What I mean by that is during matches, I feel more rushed because I'm not able to read the opponent's ball as well. I'm not as relaxed. And I tend to push the ball. I play too conservatively, etc. Some days, not often, when I just play deep, safe, loopy balls, I can win effortlessly, but I don't like playing that game. I think it's because my game isn't consistent enough to play the way I want to play. I don't want to win ugly by just getting the ball back and causing unforced errors. I want to play my matches like I play in practice, dictate the ball from the baseline, stretch, push, pull the opponent when I want to, hit targets with pace, hit neutral shots with pace, et cetera. So to kind of summarize um, Eric's very common problem is he's playing a lot better in practice than he is in matches. And uh, Eric, the good news is this is real common, like, Everybody. Everyone. Like Roger Federer, if you could see his practice matches, you'd be even more blown away by how good he is at tennis. But as far as some specific things to think about here for how to make that transition, do you have anything that jumps immediately to your head? I've got a few thoughts I can start with if you want. Yeah, start us off and then I'll round the bases. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, and this is true of of any tennis player, I, I assume, I still don't play as well in matches as I do in practice, but what I have found is the more times I put myself under pressure, um, the better I get at dealing with pressure. I think a lot of people think that pros just don't get nervous. It, it's not true. What happens is pros and players that have played a lot of matches and experienced that pressure situation a lot of times just get better at playing while nervous. Your nerves will never go away. You just get better at dealing with the fact that you're nervous while you're playing. So understanding that that's part of it putting in a lot of reps and pressure situations. I know in some of like the junior academies I ran at, at a previous club I worked at when I lived in DC, um, sometimes negative reinforcement was kind of like the only way to create that nervousness. Like, hey, you're rallying cross-court forehands. If you miss one in the net, you've got to do 15 push-ups. Oh man, I don't want to do 15 push-ups right, and right. I'm nervous. Um, so there's some, some things like that you can incorporate into your practice, but nothing beats the real thing. Like to get better at playing when you're nervous, you just need to have more reps playing when you're nervous. Yeah, it's getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and, and it doesn't matter what your pedigree is. I mean, I know for myself personally, um, you know, I had a long tenure of competitive tennis uh, from juniors to, to collegiate play and, and so forth. Um, but I don't spend a lot of time competing anymore. And I'll go out and I will spar with some of the college kids or, you know, really good adults. And, um, that's it's easy. It's like, yeah. oh, the game's still there. And then occasionally I'll find myself in a match and the nerves creep in and it's it's unfamiliar. Um, because no matter how much I've backlogged, it's you know, you, you keep some cash, right? Like like your computer uh, of like your your history, but um you you know, those nerves if you're not experienced, if you're not doing it as of late, um, they're gonna they're gonna creep in. So what I really want you to focus on is this term um, forced relaxation because that's what's happening, right? Like, you know, Eric, that you are relaxed in your practice sessions and you're not relaxed in your practice matches. And that is the difference with, with the tension. Um, and if you haven't read it, The Inner Game of Tennis by, by Tim Galway is the absolute best resource or, on all of this. He talks it's about it. It's the Bible for mental toughness, honestly. It is. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's been around since the seventies. Uh, he wrote a book on basketball that the Golden State Warriors also contributed to their first championship. But w- what he talks about in this forced relaxation is we know that we need to relax so that we immediately start going into, we get in the match and we're like, shake your hands out, get into your breathing. You're trying to relax, but like you're conscious that you're not relaxed. Right. So like it's this perpetual thing where, you, where it, it's not natural. It's the same way like when we slip into the zone, we everything just seems seamless. And then we realize we're in the zone and we start trying to figure out how to encapsulate it. And it's like, oh, what am I doing on my forehand? It feels so good. I mean, and then it goes away. is an emotion. Right. So it's yeah. like th- this is what you've got to understand. Like I can't tell you don't be nervous or fix the fact that you're nervous any more than I can tell you don't be sad or don't be happy. Like remember that nervousness is not just 
this thing that you're suffering because you're not at a certain skill level. It's, it's a human emotion that all humans deal with. And you're really just learning how to cope with this emotion, not eliminate it. Eliminating it's not reality. Like in a pressure situation, if you're human, you should feel nervous. It's just how you react to that feeling that you're trying to train in your practice matches. Yeah. So let's talk coping mechanisms. Like how do we get really good at dealing with these nerves? Um, you know, as Rafa said, uh, if he's not nervous, that makes him nervous, yeah. you know, like he wants to be nervous because that is, that's when he knows he's fully engaged. Um, so the coping method, me, me, like Scott said, you're not going to avoid being nervous. You have to distract yourself, right? So Galway talks about watching the threads of the ball. It's super hard to do, right? But it's really difficult to watch the threads of the ball and still focus on how nervous you are. You distract the brain into doing something else. Um, for you guys that were watching the match this morning um, between Danielle Collins and um, – why am I blanking? The, the young girl. Um, I just you know I wasn't watching. I, yeah, I, was I just – uh, Kinnon. So, sorry, Sophia Kinnon. Uh, so they, they were talking about that uh, Collins was upset because somebody was moving in one of the boxes. Right. And they were like, this is, this is kind of amateur hour. Like she's too good to be worried about these things. And, um, but they, then they mentioned that, but like, you know, she's upset and she's angry, but she started playing better. And they were like, that anger made her forget about how nervous she was. So was it a tactic that she, you know, did intentionally? We don't know. I mean, McEnroe, did he use it intentionally? Heck yeah. He would get teed up, you know, to, to shake the nerves. He'd get a little upset about something. Um, and ride that emotion, but he is the only person that I know of that could play well anger. So don't make that that you know be what it is. I know for me, if I'm not focused on watching the ball, um, I like really focusing on trying to hit at the apex. That's my my personal thing. I try to watch the ball right before it starts to descend. That's when I go to hit it. It makes me really conscious of the tempo of the match and what I'm trying to do, um, and also about like keeping moving. Count the steps. Count how many steps you take. That, that's in my point. That's my big one. So like, I don't need to think about technique on my serve anymore, but on my service games, when I'm really nervous, I just think about my service toss, not because it's going to help my serve, just because it gives me something other to think about other than how freaked out I am. Yeah. Um, I'll think about relaxing my hands on my return. Cause I know like, think about nervousness again as an emotion, but an emotion triggers very specific responses physically in your body. So for me, nervousness folds everything up like a lawn chair. My hands get tight. My feet get frozen and all of a sudden I have these little T-Rex ground strokes and, and really slow feet. So I know this about myself. So when I'm nervous, I'm not saying to myself, don't be nervous. I'm just saying to myself, okay, even though I'm nervous, let's not death grip the racket. Let's make sure I'm focusing on continuing to move my feet. Yeah. And just giving yourself, you know, small things like this to think about, take your mind off of being nervous. Guess what happens? You start to play better. And when you play better, those nerves start to subside. Um, you know, on their own. So I Eric, think that's it, man. Keep, keep practicing. Lots of match play, at least one match a week. Yeah. It's just um, reps, just like anything else. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. A lot of people saying what's up. Um, Ryan, what's going on, man, from our doubles workshop? Ryan hey, Tucker's Ryan, in the what's house. Up, man? Good to see you, Roberto, here um, from Costa Rica again, asking if we speak Spanish. Pura vida. Un, un poquito, <laughs> but not enough to communicate yeah. with you in any sort of meaningful nah. way about tennis, unfortunately. Um, live in tennis. Our man, I think his name's Sana, right? Am I pronouncing that right? I believe. And then we've got a question here from Francis, and this is a pretty good question. What is the role of the wrist in the serve? You or me? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start it. So the wrist is the most important element of the arm, right? It's why we are, are able to, to hit the, the power that we can. The ability to snap the wrist, the movement of the wrist is, is what allows it to work as a bullwhip. So what you're trying to think of your arm, your, the way your arm is working, it's a conduit for power, right? Everything that's loaded from the ground up, that's the kinetic chain, right? But as it delivers all the way through, this is the conduit of power. So it has to stay really, really loose. And it's that snap that is producing your pop. Now, I'm not a big fan of getting people to focus in on wrist snap. Um, if you make good contact, it happens automatically. It's, but you've got to keep the wrist really loose because just like a bullwhip, if you watch a bullwhip deliver itself to power, it's this coil and then that delivery there, right? And that's exactly what happens on the serve. So the wrist is the most important part of the anatomy 
of the arm. Because and to if continue you're, that analogy, if you're not loose, yeah. it's like you're just hitting somebody with a stick. Right. Yeah. Right? Like totally. there's, no, there's no crack at the end of that of mm -hmm. that swing, right? Yeah, it'd be totally different. You want to be able to deliver those, you know, hundred mile per hour serves. Okay, cool. Um, this is a very tough question, but I'll let you try. Oh, thanks, buddy. <laughs> Um, Cardinal fifteen sixty one has asked, "What are the eight modes of the serve in layman's terms?" Oh wow, that's getting that that is getting complex. So I'm, I'm I could write a paper on this, but I don't know if on the spot live I'm gonna I'm happy to let you answer this if you feel up to it. Yeah, so I mean I'll briefly go through what I know off the top of my head. Um, so what you're referring to is Mark Kovacs is um. The, the eight phases of the serve. Um, and, and like I said, the kinetic chain is all starting from the ground up. So like we have the loading phase and I'm going to skip, like I'm not going to go all over eight because some of them are, you know, like getting set, like, you know, how you're lining up would be one. And then, you know, the loading phase uh, starting with the legs, um, that firing from the hip, that's, that's a big portion of that eight phase is, is loading from the rear leg and firing up from your back hip. Um, that's going to be a big part, um, going through corkscrewing. So corkscrewing is like, you got to think about power happening in, in two different methods. Um, one is, is a shoulder over shoulder, right? So like getting, if you imagine like if I was shooting a bow and arrow and I'm getting into this direction, this is one, because this is helping me create this length up to the ball. But then two is corkscrewing the same way that we throw, right? So if my hips are on a are, are linear, right? I'm not going to have the ability to unwind. So corkscrewing is getting back around, right? And then as we're working through, we're going through the racket drop. The racket drop is the absolute most important. And at the, the recreational level, it's the one that's missed the most. It's where we see waiters tray. Uh, and, and that's the power other. position too. Yeah. So, so when we talk about like trophy position, that's, that's your power position, but the racket drop is the ability for the racket to actually get down your back. It's, it's what we see doing this, right? As opposed to like what we see a lot of players like doing this or just maybe even this. Um, and then we're working up through contact and the wrist snap. Um, and then there's the deceleration phase. Do you decelerate in your serve? Yeah, with landing, right? Like as you're going through, is this the left, the reason your left arm as a righty tucks is because as it starts to decelerate, the right hand picks up, but you also have to stick the landing as your momentum is coming forward. So maybe not exactly in order, but that is that that is the essential phases of the serve. Yeah, man. That's impressive. Yeah. yeah. That's not easy to remember. I mean, I can coach it if I get you out on the tennis court and you're messing one of them up. But I didn't use all the fancy like anatomy and all like Kovacs is a PhD, man. That guy is like all He's in. definitely smart. But yeah, yeah. The phases of the serve are 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 are, are kind of universal. So fun fact, I just learned that I can put the question that somebody asked up on the screen so everybody knows what we're talking about. Look at me, technology look, wizard. Look who's growing. Look at that. All right. So Sana wants to know. As you can now see on the screen, should we use body weight transfer for all forehand shots? I'm happy to field this one briefly. Um, yeah. The answer is if there's time, absolutely. Um, and, and really, that should be the goal, right? So if you're pulled out of position, sometimes you're not going to be able to transfer your weight forward into the shot. But the goal is always to either set your feet, plant your feet. If you have time, sometimes even step into the ball. So yes, you should always be trying to transfer weight into the shot. Sometimes it's not appropriate. Sometimes you need to, to, to back up and reset your feet. But even in those situations, I guess you are still transferring your weight forward, yeah? Yeah, okay. it's really, I mean, like the only time you're not is when you're truly defensive. Defense, yeah, yeah, if I'm stretched all the way wide and I'm, I'm playing through um, kind of a linear force where like I'm kicking out, like there are my hips trying to drive around, but there's times that you're going to get stuck and you're just playing off to the, the, the side of the ball. But anytime neutral, you know, or, neutral offensive. or offense yeah. there's always weight being transferred whether you're going from your front foot and and pivoting around or if you're working from that back leg firing to the left leg or left to right if you're lefty always have a weight transfer i agree completely um you can talk about this a little bit again so brooke wants to know what was the force relaxation book again you want to talk a little bit more about what the inner game of tennis like yeah. specifically it's such hey brooke we don't make a commission on this but like if, if you're a tennis player and you want to be mentally tough that's that's the book right i mean the inner game of tennis yes yeah for it's sure. it's uh brooke it's the inner game of tennis um uh, by tim galloway um like i said written back in the 70s the the, the dudes uh you know kind of the the standard alan fox and there's all kinds of other people that are 
really, really uh, Jim Lord, three guys that are really good with the mental game. But Galloway was the, the first one, to my knowledge, that really started talking about how we feel on the court and how to uh, to work around nerves and, and and right brain and left brain and all this other stuff. I'm into that stuff. Though. Like I like the it psychology just, of it. It just makes you feel normal too because I think for a lot of players – we freak out and have all these mental lapses and we think there's something wrong with us. And then I read that book and I was like, all right, sweet. Like everybody's a psycho just like I am. Yeah. 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 And it, it really, it and when you it. get Steph Curry, that's like, yeah, this it, book won us a championship and it had nothing. I mean, he wrote a book on basketball, but it was the same principle as I was like, all right, if Steph's in the NBA championship getting nervous, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's some credibility yeah. behind that endorsement for sure. Will Wong, my man, good to hear from you, dude. I haven't talked to you in forever. Appreciate hey, you saying hello. Um, Bjorn Watlington, I believe. You guys can decide how it's pronounced. Um, says, I just got off the court where I was chipped to death. Conditions were windy. Would you recommend a chip game or playing through the ball? I find playing through the ball, I make more mistakes. Um, Ordinarily, yeah. But, I mean, in the windy conditions, that's – I'm going to tell That's you this. Brutal. It depends which direction the wind is blowing also. Yeah. If you're getting a swirling wind, then I think slice is very difficult to control um, unless you're really knifing through it. I mean, there, there's a lot of yeah. circumstances here, Bjorn, that we need to know a little bit more about your game, about the actual conditions. But as a general rule of thumb, if there's a swirling wind, I would say try and drive flatter through the ball. Like a high loopy ball or a flowing slice is, is not going to do the same damage and it's going to be a lot harder to control it is going to be easier to flatten it out a little bit and, and hit through the wind. Would you tend to agree with that? Yeah. Analysis? And I think the best strategy there is get to the net, right? If it's, especially if the wind is behind your opponent, right? If they're chipping a lot, it's so hard to pass somebody with a chip, right? And you almost eliminate their chip lob if the wind's behind them, because as you push in, anything they try to float up for a lob is typically going to push out if the wind's behind them. Right. So by coming into the net, you're really eliminating the, the, the way the wind affects everything. You don't want a ball moving a lot on the court as it bounces because of the wind. So the, the, going to the net is always going to be a winning strategy when it's windy. For, for sure, for sure. Um, this is a great question from our man Sana. Um, if my opponent rushes to the net, uh, their servers and volleyers, how do we handle it? Is lob the only way? So I'll, I'll do a little visual demo here. Try not to step on my dog. Um, <laughs> Grab some magnets here. Sorry, you're trying to pivot around your dog as well. All right, so you're returning. Your part or opponent rather is serving, coming to the net. Let's just assume that they're serving in this general direction. Maybe they're pulling you out wide. So here's some things to look for. Um, you're trying to pay attention to where your opponent settles in at the net. So you've got two options, and I think most people forget about option number two. Option number one is obviously to lob. So that is an option. Um, option number two is to hit him in the feet. So what I'm looking for is when somebody comes to the net, I'm trying to see, are they closing in really tight? Are they hanging back closer to the service line? Is there space to hit him in the feet and get him to pop that ball up where I can come in and attack? Or are they crowding the net so tight that you know a lob is an obvious decision? There's also another piece to think about is whether or not they understand how to shadow the ball correctly. So if they follow the ball, in, and we talked a lot about this on, on single strategy mm -hmm. and tactics live stream last night, but if they follow the ball in correctly, all you're really looking to figure out is where is the open space? Is it forward in front of them to their feet or is it behind them to the lob? Or if they haven't hit their approach shot or their serve or whatever brought them to the net strong enough, maybe you're feeling confident you're looking for the open space for the pass. But in general, just don't forget Hitting them in the feet is a is a very viable and very good option, especially in singles, particularly off a of serve and volley, because most players aren't serving and making it, you know, close enough to the net where you can't hit that first ball right at their feet. So, dip it, rip it, and then wait for them to pop it up and put the ball away is, is certainly just as good of an option. Yeah, I mean, it's my favorite go to, and in fact, uh, collegially was the coach's only option. Uh, it, it, within the first few games to establish it, to get when you're routinely dipping at somebody's feet, what they're going to do is they're going to rush in tighter in order to prevent it. Um, and that's what makes the lob even more accessible. So it's the combination of playing at their feet and playing over them. Both of them make each shot better. Uh, so the dip and rip, as Scott said, is the, is definitely the option there. Cool. Um, 
I call dibs on this because this is my favorite topic to talk about. Um, Peter Short wants us to talk about the grips on the return and how to hold the racket when you don't know if you're getting a forehand or a backhand. We put together a video on this, yeah. and I'm just going to regurgitate that same information back right now. But if you go inside of the platform and just search grips uh, under the video instruction portal, this video will pop up, and, and it goes in a little more detail. But simply put, and I'm not going to get into an argument right now over what the correct forehand grip should be. I, I think there's many options. I use an Eastern forehand. Nate uses a semi-Western forehand. I would teach most of my students probably a semi-Western forehand. But the idea is, and I'm going to talk about two-handers first, and then I'm going to talk two-handed backhands first, then I'll talk about the one-handed backhand. Whatever grip you use on your forehand, so for me it's Eastern, that is the bottom hand of your grip when you return serve. And whatever your left hand is doing when you hit your two-handed backhand, um, I would be coaching you that it should either be flush behind the strings, and I'll come up close to the camera so you can see this. I would coach that it should either be flush behind the strings or one bevel under to create more of a semi-Western feel. But whatever that, that two-handed backhand, whatever that left hand is doing, if you're a right-handed player, whatever that top hand is doing, um, when you hit that backhand, that's where your top hand should be. So I've got my routine forehand grip on bottom. I've got my routine backhand grip on top. And so here's what happens. When somebody hits the serve to me, I either just let go and I can hit a forehand or I don't have to think. I've already got my top hand on my two-handed backhand in place. And remember, for a two-handed backhand, your top hand should be doing all the work. So as that racket comes back, my bottom hand is going to naturally rotate into whatever position is comfortable to hit my two-handed backhand. But here's the mistake. After every two-handed backhand you hit, now your bottom hand has shifted and it's in an incorrect position. So you've got to shift that back to your forehand. So I probably confuse you guys a little bit there to summarize and really provide clarity here. When you're waiting in ready position, whether you're returning serve or you're in the middle of the point, your bottom hand should always be whatever grip you use to hit your forehand. Your top hand should always be whatever the top hand grip of your two-handed backhand is. And after every ball you hit, you're going to revert back to that same ready position. On the forehand, it's easy. You let go, you hit your forehand, you add that hand right back. On the backhand, as you pull your racket back, your bottom hand's naturally going to, naturally going to shift. So after you hit your backhand, you're going to have to readjust and find that forehand grip on bottom again. Um, I see a ton of players get this wrong, and it's one of the main reasons we struggle with return to serve. We're just not ready to grip and rip. So if you fix this, um, Peter, in your game, hopefully it provides. Now, Peter, if you have a one-hander, I'll just throw a quick Oh, I get it. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah have, it, go ahead, yeah. It doesn't, yeah. So the if you have a one-hander, you're just starting with your hand up on the throat, yep. right? So like I'm semi-Western grip. My hand's here playing with a one-hander now. I'm still in my forehand grip, right? But my hand's up here because I went length away. If I do this, I'm going to have to slide my hand up for the one-hander. You're starting with both hands on the grip as a two-hander because that's really where your racket's going to go. So that's just the the different the the difference there between the two-hander and the, uh, the the one-hander. Very cool. Um, not sure I pronounce this. Dima D, maybe. What do you think that's called? Dima D. Dima D. What's up? Tell me yeah, if your name's Dima not D. Dima D. Um, how do I get my shots to pierce through the court? I feel like most of my forehands end up floating through the air. I would assume the guidance here is racket head speed, but do you want to go into a little more detail? Uh, I mean, it's a tough one because we got to see that, it. Yeah, well, and without the details. Um, so, yeah, racket head speed is is where you're going to get most of your velocity, right? So, like, if you're coming under the ball and you're swinging and the strings are here, like you're floating the ball. But the racket head, uh, creating racket head speed is all about the lag. All right, we talked about this quite a bit in singles, the, the, the singles live feed last night. But so the main point is like, I have to keep the grip relatively, well, really loose. And then this is the key position on my forehand is that the racket is always below the wrist. All right. And so the lag, what we're talking about, I'll see if I can fit this into frame here. But the lag is that when I'm working through the stroke, I want this racket right below my wrist. And I want the butt cap off center because as my hips fire, that means the racket's catching up to contact. And that's what the last lag is, the wrist lag, right? And so with that effect, that's what gives us a lot of speed. Um, that takes time, right? It's going to take time to, to feel. But in the interim, what I would feel or what I would work on is trying to find the ball at the apex of work on driving. If you feel like you have too much loft, right, we want to go more through the court. You're talking about like penetrating pace. When the ball is ascending, right, 
take it at the apex. That means just before gravity starts to bring it down and make the strike a little bit more linear, right? And go out to your target to really find that kind of penetrating pace. I think that would be the quickest fix uh, to, to fix those floating forehands. And you got a response from Dima D. Uh, I think my grip is too tight, like you said. Okay. Um, Kevin Sun wants to know, are you guys good tennis players or just good at talking? I'm a really good tennis player and Nate's just good at talking. Thanks for asking. <laughs> um, Ivan wants rude. to know, yeah, <laughs> Kevin, that's rude and hurtful. We're just here. Yeah. And you're on Periscope, which you might be our first Periscope live stream viewer ever so i'm i'm gonna make fun uh, of you we always hate like qualifying <laughs> like like uh resumes or whatever but uh yeah, i'm actually two five yeah. yeah i just started yeah we uh we we we, we were nationally ranked juniors collegiate players um but as it turns out we're american so we didn't make it on the pro tour <laughs> um a little older sure banged up these days but yeah there, there's some experience there um kevin thanks for asking man yeah <laughs> All right, so Ivan um, wants to know, can you explain about separation angle for the forehand? This is your sweet spot. Oh, before I forget to, who are we just talking to? Uh, Dima D, go inside your plus platform and look at, we have a full-blown course in there that you have access to for free as a plus member on just the forehand. Um, and it talks about shape versus drive, how to generate heavy top spin versus how to generate drive through the court. So definitely, um, definitely go check that out. Um, do you want to field this one? Can you explain about separation angle for forehand? I'm not sure that I follow. I'm not sure that I follow either, to be honest, which is why I punted to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, hey, who needs friends? When... <laughs> yeah, you know, good luck with this question. Hey, uh, uh, I would provide make... a little more clarity for us and, and we'll definitely help you out here. I'm not sure we understand the question. Um, separation angle. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. Um, but Comment down below and, and elaborate a we'll little do bit our more best, and, man. and we'll yeah. get to you for sure. A little more detail. Por favor. Um, all right. Numair asks, does a difference in take back style, uh, in other words, the tip of your racket facing upwards versus strings facing down or tip facing forward affect topspin? Um, we'll talk about that one first. And then he wants to know about um, turning the shoulders on the kick serve. So do you want to talk about? Yeah, I'll jump into the forehand. So the short answer is yes. Yeah. So can I, can I borrow your racket? We have one racket between the two of us. Um, which is, hey, if you guys yeah, haven't the seen this pro new. staff either, this thing is she, so sweet. It's, she is sexy. This is the Fed uh, model. Scott just got this in, so we're taking a look at it until we have it out. Um, all right. So as far as we're talking about the next, what's referred to as the next generation forehand and the modern forehand. So the modern forehand with the tip up on the take back, if I'm here, this is going to give us a ton of spin. Right. And the idea is that I'm creating leverage over the ball. The rocket still has to drop and then it picks up speed as it's working through. Um, you know, we talk about that lag in the slot. It's picking up a ton of speed up to that ball. So the, what we're seeing now is the next gen is to where the rocket is starting here. And this is providing more RPNs and more power. It's why we're seeing it. I don't know that it's proven yet. I, I don't know if that's where tennis goes. I mean, uh, you're seeing it on the likes of, of, of Curious. Uh, Curious, Tiafo, Jack Sock. There's plenty of people doing it. But keep in mind that still the three best players in the world are still modern. Djokovic, Federer, and Adol. We're still seeing the racket head up. But what this is doing by working through the next gen, if I'm this way and I'm working through this pattern – it's just creating more movement. So if we're talking about the rocket moving like a roller coaster or in that, I want to make sure I'm in friend, working like a roller coaster as I'm going through the modern forehand, right? And working through the shop, I'm just giving it more room to work as I work through the next gen. So obviously momentum, the longer, the more length and momentum, the more speed and therefore the more RPMs. Right. Think about if you're going to get on a roller coaster, if you if you're going up for a really, really, really long time and you're getting ready to come down a really big hill, a lot more momentum than if you just go up in one of the little, you know, yeah. little inclines. Yeah. So like, I mean, yeah. I teach it. Uh, Ryan Charles, who you've seen in a lot of our videos, he has that next gen forehand. Um, and, and honestly, most of the collegiate, if you if you watch, you know, a lot of the, the NCAA players, D1, most of them do. Um, but the modern forehand, especially, I, I personally feel like for four, five, and below, the modern forehand is is, is where it's at. Yeah. 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 I think that's right. 
All right, let's keep moving on here. Good gracious, we get a lot more questions here. Um, That's a good thing, man. It is a good thing. <clears throat> um, Scott struggles with reading, so it's sometimes my, my a daunting task. Yeah, but just bear with us. He's he's been working hard. Um, sound it out. Remember, sound out the words. You can believe I have to work with this guy every day of my life. It's unbelievable. All right. Numer uh, asks, when doing an open stance forehand, you're answering this because you're a jerk. So I'm just, <laughs> when doing an open stance forehand, do you stop in the power position, i.e. where the racket tip is facing the sky before accelerating, or is it one fluid movement? Yeah, that's a great, great question. You pause for like a millisecond. Um, there are preferences. I mean, like if you <laughs> – you know, like Serena holds, she holds back into this position. I, I, I think that's unique to her and Venus uh, and maybe a few other players. But ultimately, so what you want to think of is like what we're referring to is the unit turn. The rack is going to work or the, the, the take back is going to work in sections. So I go unit turn, right? And so this is my first move. So it may pause here for a moment. But as soon as that ball is, is, is coming to, you know, crosses the net, this all should be happening continuously. So to answer your question, just briefly, I recognize that I'm getting a forehand, and then as soon as I'm in action, I'm moving, I'm moving out to the open stance, everything else is continuous. But by this time I've out set out my right foot, it'll my right foot will step out along with the racket, and then as I'm working to the ball, everything else is continuous. So you can hold it for a moment, but you shouldn't you shouldn't be pausing there for a long, long time. It should be fairly continuous. Am I answering that right? You said with the open yeah. stance? That, that was the exact question. Okay. I'm just to make sure I understood the question. Yeah, the question was in the power position. Like, are you supposed to hold here for a long time on the forehand, or is it supposed to be more well, of a whip effect? And I guess, so it, it, in case I'm misinterpreting, if you're too. moving out to the ball, like let's say I had a running forehand, I'm going to initiate my unit turn as I'm running. So there I would have it for a, a, a while. But then as soon as I get my feet set, then it's all going to be a fluid motion. Some of this changes with your skill level too. Like I know um, – Plenty of like three O's and three fives that I coach. My focus is just get the racket back before the ball bounces. Once you get to a high enough level of play, you don't have to think about that quite as much anymore. And then maybe you have more of a, you know, a fluid turn and rip where you're not sitting here in this position for a really long time. Like maybe you would at a lower level where you're just thinking about getting your racket back earlier. Yeah. Like when you're first learning the loop on your forehand, whether it's next gen or just traditional, um, you're going to be a little bit late and you might – experience some instruction that says, you know, get that whole thing happening before the ball bounces on your side. Let of the me court. clarify this real quick. Cause I think I, I want to make sure I'm not confusing anybody and make sure that I'm in frame. If I'm moving, this is my unit turn here. Where am I more in frame? All right. So here, uh, I gotta get there's a dog here. underneath you. If that makes it dog. easier. So this would be my <clears throat> unit turn and this I can hold for a little bit. This is fine. If I, especially right. if I'm moving out to the ball, but once the racket starts moving back here, this is continuous. So what we see Serena doing is that she holds the racket back here. It's not here. And that's what I was saying. This, for most players, will create a disjointed forehand. If I'm, if I'm back here waiting, this is going to get funky because I'm creating tension in my shoulder forearm. But I can hold it here with this left hand. And then once it leaves that unit turn, it's all continuous. That's, I think, very good clarification. Well done. All right, next question from our man Douglas. What's up, Douglas? Douglas asks, I heard that harder or rougher, the harder or rougher the strings are, the more spin they will provide. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the manufacturers now are are making like so Alu, so Luxalon, like Alu Rough, um, they're actually making a tougher texture. You know, some of them are making these hexagon strings, um, but that'll definitely uh, create more spin. It's just more bite on the ball. Okay, cool. Going back to our boy Ivan. So he was asking about elastic energy for the upper body when he was talking about that foreign angle question earlier. Yeah. Um, so I think he's trying to figure out how to get more elastic energy from the upper body. Do you want to talk about that? Like the slingshot. Yeah, it's core kind of screwing. About so it's a little bit what we were talking about, like with a serve, <laughs> but it's going to be the same off that forehand. I want to make sure that I'm loaded back, right? And so with my legs, um, you know, we'll use a, a open stance, for example. If I load off that right leg, I want to make sure that I'm coiled. And that's part of the reason that we keep the non-dominant hand with the racket. If I do this kind of like we we used to in, in the classic days, I don't guarantee that this shoulder goes all the way around. So I want to take this non-dominant <clears throat> hand and work with my racket to make sure that I fully coil 
And then as I push through the ground with my back leg, my hip fires, and then the racket, we talked about that lag earlier, then it catches up to the ball. So if you're working on more like angular, I understand what you're saying now as far as angular momentum, make sure that non-dominant hand stays with the racket. And, and you can tell here, like my shoulder gets under my chin. And that's what I'm, that's what we're looking for. That's the key. Big coil on coil yeah. type situation, right? Yeah. I like to think, Nate just sort of highlighted a little bit. I like to think about swinging shoulder to shoulder. So like he just said, think about getting, um, if you're right handed, that left shoulder underneath your, um, your chin. But then when you finish making sure you come all the way around and you're looking over your right shoulder, that gives you that full coil and rotation. Hope so. hope that helps, man. I think that's. Oh, we got sorry about that. All right, Will H. Um, I hurt my wrist pretty badly a while ago. It's better, but not one hundred percent. Any drills, practice, advice for getting back into swinging again without rehurting it? You are the king of wrist injuries. You want to feel this one? Yeah, and it really depends. Uh, sorry to hear it that. Depends Will. on the injury. For yeah, it sure. depends on the injury. And we're not um, doctors, so let's state that first. I'll just tell you what my experience has been is. I've got a TFCC injury in my right wrist, um, and and also uh, recently, reason I switched to a one hander, I'm having some ECU issues and TFCC in the left. Um, and, and a lot of times, these things, you know, TFCC be, is the Del Potro tear, right? Yeah. So basically, you have a sheath that runs over your your wrist like this, and when you t like if you know you fall with an outstretched hand or like really big impact. Um, if you tear it, it basically shrivels back up into your arm and they can repair it. The surgery is not fantastic. Um, but when they, when they do your tennis, as soon as you, yeah, you go, well, if you go back to tennis, you're going to re-rupture it. So there's really no good surgery for it if you want to play tennis, but let's just assume it's tendonitis or something to that effect. Um, the, the main thing is to focus on contact, right? Like anytime you're late hitting the ball, that jarring effect is going to bother the wrist especially on volleys, man. So like, well, if you're up in the net and you're late on a volley and somebody wallops the ball and you're going to feel it on that wrist, that is, that is huge. So make sure that you're keeping everything out in front. When I was working through my, my, my wrist injuries, did quite a bit of uh, working on the ball machine before I got back into live play to make sure that my timing was there to make sure that I wasn't late on the ball. So I think that's, that's great. You can do that on a wall as well. Um, shadow strokes also really, really good. Um, but I would definitely tape up the wrist. And the way I would tape up the wrist is I would take a piece of tape and I would go from above the the joint and then I would go another piece of tape below the joint. And it'll work like the wrist widget. The wrist widget, we, we don't get any money for promoting them, but it's a but it's we've basically, bought enough of them that we should. <laughs> yeah, it basically does the same thing that helps hold down that ulnar tendon so it's not so aggravating. The ECU is a little bit more difficult, but the tape will help there. Yeah, I was well. going to say, well, you know, obviously I would assume if, if you've heard it really badly, you've talked to a doctor, there's probably a brace that's appropriate. Like I know Jackson um, has that sleeve that he plays in that keeps everything locked into a place mm -hmm. where he's not going to um, move enough to cause pain. Um, again, we're not doctors, but my general rule is if it doesn't hurt, it's probably okay to keep doing more of it. So I think he's saying it, it hurts. Uh, yeah, but I'm saying he <laughs> hurt his wrist a while ago i don't know if you can't read um all right uh, our friend kevin son um wants to done. know what type of play would you go to if it's the most important point of the match you want me to, you want me to field this one give it a try because it's kind of hard right give it a no, yeah, I, I mean for me it's whatever pattern of play has provided you the most success in that match it's not like a go-to necessarily i mean for me maybe if if I'm serving, maybe I've got a very specific serve on the deuce court that I feel most comfortable with under pressure, and I would start the point that way. But as far as patterns of play, whatever you found the most effective that got you to a place where the match is so important that you're at the most important point in the match, um, whatever that pattern is, you know, try and execute it. I, I think you're going to probably say the boring answer, which is uh, big, big margin for air, or big targets, you know, a lot of height over the net. That's what Nate's going to say. Go ahead, say that. <laughs> No, well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, what we're going to talk about is controlled aggression, right? Yeah. Uh, and controlled aggression is you really, you, you don't want to slow your swing down. You want to stay really aggressive. You want your targets to be bigger. That's not boring. Um, but, I'm not even paying attention. But so, I gonna say. but so what Scott said is like, what you want to be doing is on a critical point is you want to play it just how you've played every other point. What I don't like is a lot of times I see students 
you know, implementing something that they, they are, are trying for the first time in a match. Like if I've routinely taken a short ball down the line and followed it in and had success through the match, that's exactly what I should do when I get a short ball. If I get a deep ball to my backhand and I've been chipping it to their backhand, now's the time to hit the chip again. I want to do patterns that are, 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 you know, have been proven to hold up to what Scott was saying. For me, it's, it's, it's always working with my favorite serve. And then the minute I can establish my strength to their weakness, I think that's really, really big. My forehand to their backhand, I'm going to sit on that and make them win the point with their weaker side. However, the little asterisk in here, I think maybe what he's talking about, there are times though you can sneak in a play if you think your opponent is tight. So what I'm referring to here is coming to the net. Yeah. So like a serve and volley or a return and come in. I think, I think that's critical. Like maybe it's like five all in a, in a, a breaker um, and your partner gives you a second serve, hit a big ball through the middle of the court, really good margin, right? Plenty safe. But now your opponent is surprised and they're going to have to come up with a good on a really big point. Most of the time they're going to play defensive and hope you miss. I was way more excited than what I thought you were going to say. Yeah, so and I'm, I'll take it. Yeah, I like the I idea. Of, I like the idea of analyzing the situation, right? Like, and in, in, in how you're playing that day. If I'm serving out of my mind, my first serve choice may look way different uh, on the most important point of the match than if I'm having a rough service day. I might decide that, you know, I'm not feeling good about my second serve today, which definitely happened to me this past weekend in a tournament. So yeah, maybe, maybe that's not nice. <laughs> um, maybe. You know, you, what might normally be 120 mile per hour first serve is going to be me kicking it in to guarantee I get the point started if I feel confident in my ability to win a ground stroke rally. So it's very situational. Think about what gives you the best chance of, of winning the point, what's provided you the most points won in the match thus far, and look to that as your strategy. Um, all right, so Ryan Fishman says, is it normal for tennis players to develop trigger finger on the pinky side? I hurt my right hand. And started to use my left hand. Now this hand is also getting trigger finger. Man, so I think I think this was actually I was looking over the comments from the live feed last night, and I think Ryan actually submitted it, and, and we may have looked over it. Um, I thought about this, Ryan. I'm, I've never heard of someone developing trigger finger within tennis. No, me either. Right. The only I, I, thing I can think of physically is you're just squeezing way too tight. Yeah, that's the only thing I can think of that would cause that. Or, I'm not a doctor, though. So, or Ryan, I wonder. You know, I don't know what you do for a living, but you know, could be from typing. Yeah, could it be from something else that's just transcending into the tennis? But yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sorry to hear that's happening. But yeah, I, I haven't, in, in my experience, heard of anybody getting trigger finger uh, through from tennis. Tennis alone. No I hope you either. heal up, man. Um, Raja says we well, you kind of hey, just covered this so maybe do a uh, abbreviated recap but on the forehand unit turn for a right-handed player is it important to one push the left arm out straight keep the racket tip pointed skywards and catch the racket in the left hand at the end yes um, next question. next question <laughs> <laughs> yeah all those things like we, we've done videos on all of them uh, you don't have to catch the racket in the left hand at the end that's personal preference but the first two yeah yeah, oh, keeping yeah. the left hand out. Um, and well, and number two, you talked about up. keeping the racket at tip skywards. I mean, that's your maybe your next gen and maybe it's your style. Not skywards. Yeah, so if you were style. next gen and your your the tip of the racket was she here, just scared the dog clean off the camera. She's like, Sorry, I'm out of here. If your racket tips here. That's that's fine. And that's all preference. Um, but to what Scott was saying about catching the racket, that's nice in the beginning. Uh, if you just need that cue of making sure the racket's getting around, but look at Dominic team. He still does it. He practices catching it. And in his matches, he's still there, but then you have Kyrgios who, you know, he's left hands immediately off and he's finishing, you know, any and everywhere, um, without that left hand being, you know, quite as impactful. Cool. Cool. Um, Oliver asks, hey, Oliver. would you recommend using different rackets of switching between singles and doubles? Um, absolutely not really is yeah, my is my one. feedback like you your racket is your weapon you should just get really good at using one weapon you shouldn't have multiple weapons for multiple battles like i that was a horrible analogy but the mindset should be you know the ins and outs of one racket 
not you're trying to memorize the ins and outs of different rackets for different situations. But, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm going to look through the layer here is I think what Oliver's probably thinking is he has a racket that he Better really volleys. likes for serving yep. and for volleys. So it makes a lot of sense in doubles, but he doesn't necessarily like it off the ground. Um, so I, I get the rationale. And my, my brother actually uh, went through that. He, he was switching between rackets for a period. But the problem is exactly what Scott was saying is that – you, you don't when you have distrust issues with the racket in certain situations it's it's really hard to find your optimal level throughout a match so i would re i'd really try to find a racket that was maybe not great on all things but really good on all things right so maybe it doesn't serve as well but but it's I, I, have a, I have a perfect example i mean the the new pro staff that i'm holding in my hand so i had to make a decision i went through a pretty tough transition with my forehand where I was trying to figure out, I was having some arm pain and I, and I tried to lower the weight of my racket and I just couldn't find a racket where I could get pop on my serve and keep my ground strokes in the court. Like I was swinging my normal ground strokes through the ball and I was missing everything like three to four inches deep, no matter what I did with string, like it just felt like the racket wasn't heavy enough to keep the ball in the court. But then I felt the opposite you know, I had a slightly um, more evenly balanced instead of handle heavy racket to give me some more power and more pop on my serve because I was having that pain in my right arm. So you've got to sometimes, I mean, you've got to find a balance, right? Like you can't be switching rackets on changeovers when, when you're serving and returning. That's not viable. You don't see any legitimate players really doing this. So but you know what you can do? Tension. Tension. Yep. Yeah. So that was where same I was racket. Headed. That was where I was headed. Tension, so yeah. that was where I was headed next. What I ended up doing is on my return games where I knew I wasn't hitting any serves. I was playing with a racket that had a different tension. On my service games, I was playing with a racket that had a lower tension to give that pop that I wanted out of my serve, and then I was able to adjust on the ground strokes. But in general, the, the short answer to your question is is no. You should really own one racket and, and get very comfortable with it, and that should solve your problems for both singles and doubles. Guys, we've got probably about five minutes left here. Um, feel free to throw any last questions in here if we don't get to them. I'm sorry. Don't forget Plus members. If you want to make sure we get to all your questions, you can always submit them ahead of these calls in your Plus dashboard. Um, and if you have videos you're looking for analysis, remember that's a, a perk too. We're going to have a call coming that's up right. soon. Yeah, October 28th, Plus members. We're doing a video analysis call. So if you want us to take a look at your strokes and uh, show you what we think, make sure to submit those inside your Play Your Court Plus dashboard. Um, Fung says, can I get a private lesson with all? Yes. A private um, lesson, lesson with y'all. Oh yeah. Um, we do those. We do them. They're not cheap, but send us uh, a direct message. We don't, so we don't do like a one hour lesson with you. All of the types of in-person instruction we offer, and you guys have probably noticed this. We'll do workshops that take place over two days with a very specific curriculum. Like Ryan, who I saw actually here on the live stream earlier, came down to Virginia beach and worked with us on a doubles movement workshop. And the idea is that in two days, we're going to fix some of the obvious movement mistakes that you're making in doubles. Like that, It's not realistic. We're not magicians. You can't come down here and rebuild everything that's wrong in your game in, in six hours. But um, the workshops that we do are more geared towards a specific topic that we know we can actually provide change in a short period of time. So like, if you want help on on just your technique, you should be seeking that out locally. And then if you can't figure it out and you really want to, you know, take a deep dive with video analysis, then, then that's something we offer as well. But in mm -hmm. general, you know, we don't have a ton of bandwidth. We're obviously running a huge global tennis community. We're doing these live streams. We're trying to impact as many tennis players as possible. So if we're going to bring you on court, we want to make sure we can make a huge impact in your game. Um, Andrew... H24 says, what college did you play at? You want to go first or you want me to go first? Go ahead. Ladies first. <laughs> um, so I played at Virginia Wesleyan, and then I played at James Madison. Um, I won't bore you with all the details, but my senior year, I had a pretty uh, heavy arm injury. Um, Do you want to show them that scar? I don't mean to put you on the spot here. You don't have to. Yeah, I don't want to see a Griffin scar. But I had a, a, a really bad in injury where I nearly lost my arm. Um, so I played, at, uh, I played at a local school. Uh, I, we're here in Virginia Beach, so Virginia Wesleyan, and then uh, I walked on uh, at, at James Madison um, after a lot of rehabilitation, PT, and all that fun stuff. Very cool. What about you? I played at the University of Maryland, who has since cut their men's tennis team, which is a huge bummer, and it's a really huge Sad. bummer because I think they were like 35 in the country when they got cut. Like they were 
a good tennis team. But yeah, I played at University of Maryland. Um, ACC, Division, man. Division one program. Yeah, at the time they were ACC. They've since switched to the Big Ten, which is a bummer for me. I've got my family all went to ACC schools, so going there um, anytime a football or basketball game was played, there was always a phone call being like, "Haha, we beat you," or, or or so on and so forth. So super sad with the pandemic. We're seeing a lot of universities lose their tennis team, and it's uh, it's a bummer. Um, but but funding, you know, is largely carried through football and basketball, and with some of these sports being cut, the funding's not there for tennis. But that is definitely uh, a, a very sad affair for for our beloved game but I, I don't know hopefully in the future they start bringing their programs back for sure all right we'll answer one more here um, from Bjorn and actually I'll answer I'll answer two more for you so we'll, we'll get Bjorn and then sana we'll, we'll come back to your ball machine question um, I have a go-to slice backhand I get attacked on it a lot and I really want to improve the switching to flattening it or adding top spin mid rally. How would you recommend I work on that? So basically, his default stroke is a slice backhand. He wants to get more comfortable with top spin. Um, we have a great drill. Can I just show the visual of the? I mean, so go yeah. in, again, go inside the player court platform, um, search top spin, and you're going to see a great drill. I don't know how well I can demo this in an office, but I'm going to try and show you. Um, one of the things that I would do. Um, if you've got somebody that's willing, like if you've got a buddy that'll go out on the court with you and, and drop feed some balls for you, um, you would set up in your normal backhand stance like this, um, and you'd be flush to flush with their racket. So they're going to put a racket in front of where you would make contact and they'd be standing off to the side here on Nate's side, um, holding a racket in the way. And what you would think about is as they drop the ball in front of their racket, you're going to have to go under their racket and then accelerate up the back of the ball. So the, the visual here is you want to think about you're driving through to the ball and the ball's right here, but there's a target or excuse me, an obstacle in between your strings and the ball that you've got to come underneath and then quickly brush back up the back of the ball to generate that top spin. It's a lot easier to see this in the video, but go inside the player court platform, search top spin, uh, in our video section, and, and if and you'll, you don't, you'll see if, if they don't have a buddy, uh, just get close to the net, get as close to the net as you can, and do drop feeds and work on swinging under the ball, and then go once you're feeling pretty comfortable on that backhand, whether two handed or one handed, get to the service line, and go drop feeds there, and, and really focus on making sure that ball clears the net and it also bounces inside the opposing service box before it transfers over, and then get back to the baseline. Um, but the main thing with top spin is like you're looking to get your racket under the ball and it's always easier if the ball is descending, but it's going to take time to trust it. I just switched over to a one hander, as I said, because of that wrist injury um, and, and it takes time to trust it. The default is slice, um, but those practice tools will definitely help you. Very cool. Um, last two here and then we really got to cut it here. Um can you recommend some good ball machines? So I have not hit with it yet, but I have heard nothing but good things about Slinger Bag. And also just like from a business perspective, holy cow, like killing it. They went public. Like you can go buy stock in Slinger Bag. So for whatever yeah. that's worth, like um, it's a portable bag. It has wheels. You can put it in your trunk. You can bring it out to the tennis court. It kind of does a lot of what your more expensive at the country club ball machine does, but you can bring it with you. Um, so as it stands right now, I think that's kind of the kind of the best out there. Again, I have no personal experience with it, so um, I can't um, endorse it completely. Lobster There's, gets a lot. Lobster is way more expensive, but lobster gets really good reviews. I haven't personally hit on one. Um, Playmate, Playmate's what I'm familiar Playmate, with. Playmate, yeah, yeah. That's certainly um, what I see at all the clubs. Yeah. All right, last question, and this should cause some controversy on our way out the door. Oh, here. yeah, let's get it. One more. From Peter Short, um, I call dibs on answering first. Does collegiate tennis help develop American pros, or has it held back American tennis? I ask because it's a dramatically different system than in Europe. Yeah. So my honest opinion, and this is certainly my opinion, is that in the United States, team sports like basketball and football are potentially robbing a lot of our athletes Whereas I think in Europe, it's primarily tennis or soccer that you really get into and stick with, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't live in Europe, so maybe I'm completely off base here. But from talking to, you know, my European teammates when I play Division I college tennis, a lot of those players are, are using tennis as a way to get to the U.S., not to say that's you know, where you want to be these days. But um, I think for a lot of people, um, 
you know, tennis in the United States, if, if you're wealthy enough to come from a family that's spending that much money on your tennis to where you're aspiring to play division one college tennis, right. you probably could have played any other sport that you wanted to. I mean, I, I would be very curious what happened if you put a tennis racket in Tom Brady or LeBron James hands, you know? Yeah. Like, I mean, I Nadal think all wanted to play soccer. I don't know. For those of you who know, like his favorite sport was soccer. He wasn't good enough at it. So he chose tennis. Good thing, I guess. But yeah, he was really I, good at I soccer. Think, though. Yeah. I mean, I think in the U S you just have, more options and people follow the money and there's more of it and more guaranteed of it in some of these team sports. So with it being what it is, uh, I would say college, college tennis is good for developing the pros. Uh, and, and we have examples of Stevie Johnson and John Isner and a few others. Um, but, but to the fact, like that's not necessarily the issue. It's, it's the issue that Scott touched on. It's just, we just do not have our best athletes in the game of tennis. Yep. Um, where if you look around the country, they're, they're getting a much larger pool of superior athletes that are, that are playing the game. Um, like Randy Johnson probably would have been a John Isner if he had decided to go the tennis route. Yeah, possibly live arm. Um, but yeah, I, and it's not a bad thing. You know, Patrick McEnroe talked about this uh, a few years back at, at the USPTA conference, the World Conference. And, and what he was saying is like, you know, we end up with some really well diversified kids. Um, and, and it's a luxury that we have so many sports to choose from. But the goal as tennis instructors and tennis coaches is to, to really f make people fall in love with, with the game. And if we're looking for a champion, find the best athletes out there and, and have them fall in love with the game. Um, I know for myself personally, you know, there was only a few things that I, I really enjoyed, um, you know, tennis, basketball, and surfing. I wasn't tall enough or fast enough to be efficient in basketball, but it was really difficult um, <laughs> playing, playing uh, in, in front of a crowd to where it's, it's very like glamorous or all. And then I would go to a tennis court and it would be my mom, which is awesome. Cause I love my mom. But, you know, it's Hi, Connie. it wasn't getting me uh, any phone numbers or anything in high school. But it made a ton of sense to, to, to go into tennis. And, man, and it's why we just love this sport, too, is because, like, yes, is it, it – are we falling short on the professional level? Sure. But, the, you know, the more people we get in this game, to be able to enjoy this game throughout their entire lives, that, that's incredible. The people that I grew up, grew up playing basketball with, not playing basketball anymore. That's the thing, man. I mean, I'll never forget this. And this is a shout out if Mark DiCera, if you happen to be watching. So I worked at a club called Georgetown Prep Tennis Club. And John Adams, my boss there, recorded a message on the recording system that I won't ever forget. Welcome to Georgetown Prep Tennis Club, where tennis is a family sport for a lifetime. And that's true. Like, I, in seventh grade, had to choose between playing. I'm down here in Virginia where lacrosse is huge. So I had to choose actually between lacrosse and tennis I was actually just as good maybe even a little bit better in seventh grade at lacrosse than I was at tennis and I had to choose between the two because for my high school season they were in the same um, the same season so I couldn't play both sports um, where I landed with it was I can probably play tennis until the day I die I don't know anybody over the age of 22 that plays lacrosse anymore I'm sure there's leagues um, that's like that's I, hockey right like with without ice skates no, no, no. It's the stick with the net on it. You throw the ball at people. Hockey. You can hockey. check people. It's hockey I mean, it was fun. And, and to put it in perspective, I was the same height I am now at 135 pounds. So it was a much scarier sport to be good at as a tall, uh, skinny it's, kid. It's field hockey for dudes. <laughs> Unbelievable. On I that, play, on that I didn't note, play lacrosse. On that note, we're going to shut it down for today. Yeah, Nate was really good at backgammon, but uh, lacrosse <laughs> slipped by him. Um, guys, thanks so much. If you had a good time here, if, if you, if we provide any value today, do us a favor, press the like button on whatever platform you're liking. We really appreciate seeing awesome. that. Yeah, if you're watching you. us on YouTube, please press subscribe. I know, um, people just think that's like a template ask that, that us YouTubers, uh, make, but it really does help our business. So, um, press like, if you had fun today, press subscribe. And for all you player court plus members, don't forget Video analysis live call coming up on the 28th of October. If you want your video analyzed, your strokes analyzed by Nate and I, go ahead and submit that and check out the uh, plus live training for all the upcoming events. We will talk to you guys soon. Guys, thanks, thanks so much. much. Really appreciate you being here. We'll see you soon. Ciao.